So now we are going to get started with the panel portion of our program. We're going to begin with a short presentation on the status of the region's economy from Dr. Wallace Walrod, Chief Economic Advisor to the Orange County Business Council. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wallace Walrod. Thank you, Michelle. I'm actually going to invite my, our team up here of economists uh, because we're going to transition very quickly into the uh, presentations and then into what I think is going to be a very interesting panel discussion. So good morning, everybody. It's uh, really a delight for us to be here today. Um, as Michelle said, it's been um, great to see over seven years how this has uh, grown to the conference that it is today. But I think it's also um, let's see if we can put up the slides. Easy to kind of forget that when we started these economic summits back in 2010, it was during the very depths of the worst recession of our lifetimes. That kind of seems like a long time ago now, to me at least. But when you look at these charts, it looks a little bit to me like back to the future. In fact, at last year's summit, we reported that Southern California has recovered all the jobs lost during the Great Recession. So the Skag region has made a tremendous amount of progress, but you'll see from our slides and from our discussion later that there's still much work to do, as we'll discuss during the panel. We're going to be very brief with these upfront presentations because we do want to get to that panel discussion very quickly, but did want to just set the table by saying 2016 has brought additional solid economic growth to the Skag region and that's thanks both to the strong traditional uh, industry growth and emerging industry clusters which have served to drive economic activity across Southern California. Approximately 8.8 .8 million SCAG residents are employed. That surpasses 2009 employment levels by over 1 million workers. At the regional level, we're at 5.3% unemployment, and we've reduced the number of unemployed individuals in the region to about 490,000, and that further, further highlights the significant progress this region has made, as that represents over a 51% decrease from the over 1 million unemployed individuals uh, who were out of work in 2009. Okay, let's see. Somebody help me advance. There we go. So while the continued economic growth and job creation means, uh, remains a key goal for the Skag region, other factors have emerged, including educational attainment, income and poverty trends, and workforce housing affordability, which should command an equal amount of attention as they have immense impacts on the future of the region. The good news is that progress is being made, but it needs to be accelerated. Median income in the Skag region increased by a pretty healthy 4.6% to over $62,000. And for the first time since we've been tracking it, this growth rate exceeded income growth in the Bay Area in the last 12 months that we have data for. However, Bay Area incomes are still about 42% higher than Skag region incomes. Additionally, we've made progress on the poverty rate. It dropped from 17.4% to 15.9% with noteworthy improvements in LA County and Ventura County. Growing incomes in the Skag region is especially important at this time and a much needed reprieve for many local families, as in recent years, the affordability crisis has manifested itself throughout the region as the cost of living has been consistently pushed up by persistently high and still increasing housing prices. In fact, yesterday in the Orange County Register, the median new home price hit a record of over $934,000 in Orange County last month. So however, we know that long term, education is the real key for the Skag region to move forward. The percentage of Skag region residents with a bachelor's degree or higher increased slightly from 29.2 to 29.6%, that was primarily boosted by increases in Orange County and Ventura County. 
But despite these improvements, the Skag region trails the national and state rates of 30.6 and 32.3 percent respectively. Additionally, the Skag region still needs to make substantial improvements to close the gap when compared to Bay Area performance, as evidenced by the over 45 percent of Bay Area residents holding a bachelor's degree or higher, and that gap grew again in the last year. It's grown, that gap has grown every year that we've been tracking it. We'll talk much more on that during our panel discussion. So now, as I said, we're going to be very brief at this front end. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bracken to briefly report on Imperial County highlights. Well, good Mike. morning. This is live. Perfect. Good morning. And my name is Mike Bracken. I'll be uh, giving you the report on what's going on in Imperial County. Unfortunately, Imperial County is the, uh, is the only county within the Skag region where the unemployment actually went up uh, year over year from 18 to 22 percent. There was some good news, about 1,200 new logistic and transportation jobs and about 700 new management type jobs. Unfortunately, the region did shed about 1,200 construction jobs. And that goes to really one of the largest sectors in the, uh, in the region, which is renewable energy. You know, there's two things that the valley uh, grows and provides for you. One is food, the other is the lights and the air conditioning. Um, we're going through a little bit of a lull in Imperial County right now in terms of the uh, uh, renewable energy projects that are under construction. And as California has met RPS 33 and we start making our way to RPS 50, there's more projects under entitlement. But during that lull, that, that really explains the, uh, the construction job issue. In terms of energy production overall, Imperial County is the third largest producer of renewable energy in the state of California. Uh, over 2,000 megawatts of energy are being produced by about uh, 43, 43 different projects. Agriculture, of course, is the, uh, is the largest portion of the sector in Imperial County. $1.9 billion worth of product was produced uh, last year. 535,000 acres, 535,000 acres in that county are used for ag production. That's 835 square miles. Let me try and put that in this, an easy uh, way to understand that. That's larger than the city of Los Angeles and the city of San Diego combined. It's a fairly significant uh, uh, landmass. Livestock leads the way at about half a billion dollars a year, along with vegetables and melons, which is another $800 million a year. Incomes in the Imperial Valley have increased a little bit over the last few years. But if you understand ag economies and service economies like the Imperial Valley, then you'll know why. Every time there's a minimum wage increase, the people of Imperial County will feel that the day it happens. And that's because there are so many minimum wage and low wage workers in the service and ag industries uh, there. So median wage, by the way, is about $41,000 a year, a median family income. Poverty, unfortunately, is not what Wallace has described in terms of the Skag region as a whole. One in three children live in poverty in Imperial County. One in three. Overall, 25% of Imperial County uh, is in poverty. Now, some good news. Uh, Wallace just talked about a new home price in Orange County of $934,000. The median home price in Imperial County is $202,000. So you all want to come east a little bit. We've got some nice brand new homes, <laughs> about 1,800 square foot in size. The, the yards are pretty big, eight to 10,000 square foot yards. <laughs> nice. You'll put Probably four bigger than Orange County. Yeah, you'll yeah. put four homes in that in Orange County. That's right. So let me talk about headwinds uh, real quick. There's some things that are certainly troubling. First is this. If many of you remember in the 80s, uh, the family farms in the Midwest went by the wayside. They became corporate farms. Well, and that was really for tax reasons oftentimes and for lack of staying power when the economy was tough. Today in Imperial County, we're, we're seeing something different, and that is the millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, they don't have any interest in farming. They don't have any interest in working 16, 18 hours a day in 120 degree heat seven days a week. I don't know why it sounds uh, pretty alluring. They want to spend time with their friends and families. So what's happening is as the generation that owns the farms now are finishing up, they are not uh, uh, passing them on. And it's because the kids have uh, flown the proverbial coop. Um, the other one is cattle. So um, Hassan and Darren, I know you're in the room somewhere. Uh, I'm going to make the bet now, next year at lunch, when we're sitting here, we're having chicken, not beef. There's a reason for this. Beef prices are so low right now at the wholesale level, uh, under a dollar a pound, when the uh, break even is about a dollar thirty-five, that new beef is not being planted, so to speak. Remember, it takes about 18 months to bring something to market. Farmers are losing $500 a head. Every time they send a head of cattle to the slaughterhouse, 
they're writing a check for $500 when they do it, which means they're not planting anymore. Beef prices a year from now, in my opinion, will be between 30 and 40 percent higher at the consumer level than they are now, a typical supply and demand uh, issue. Finally, farm regulation. Um, you know, I, I realize that California is trying to save the environment, but at the same time, you know, farmers are trying to grow the crops for the food that we eat. We're going to see increased automation uh, because of some of the labor rules that are out there. We actually are now seeing testing of thinning machines. Now, crop thinning is one of the largest uh, producers of jobs, but we're now seeing machines that actually go through and laser point and kill the plants that need to be killed along the way for thin thinning. Finally, this. Probably the biggest risk to Imperial County, and I'm going to suggest the Coachella Valley as well, is the Salton Sea. How many of you know the Owens Lake story? Please raise your hands. Guess what? It's playing out right now. My question for the SCAG region, for you as leaders, for the state of California, for the federal government, are you going to let that continue to play out or are you going to do something about it? Because if not, the prevailing winds that occur and the Santa Ana winds that come in in the fall months will literally destroy the agriculture and tourism economy of those two regions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So let's move on to Los Angeles County. Christine Cooper from LAUDC, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that wonderful down note, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's such a pleasure to be here again to represent Los Angeles County and talk about LA County, uh, a, a county with 88 cities, um, 10 million in population and 4.3 million in the labor force. So we account for a very large share of the Skag region overall. Uh, I think LA County had been on a pretty steady employment growth and economic growth path. Um, we have recovered all the jobs that we lost during the recession. Uh, probably added around 70,000 jobs over the last year. Um, I think barring any major catastrophic event, we're going to continue on this path for the next couple years. Uh, unemployment is right now at 5.1% in October, uh, which is quite far from the 13.2% we had at the peak in, uh, of, our, of our recession in, in July of 2010. So we are expecting employment growth around 2, 2.5% 2 over the next couple of years. It's going to be across many different sectors. Our poverty rate is coming down as well, not fast enough, I'm sure. Uh, it declined in 2015 for the third year in a row, though, so we are on a right trajectory in this case. So, you know, all of that is good news, and um, we have to think about that. We have to remember that during the recession, we lost 450,000 jobs in L.A. County alone. And it took us eight years to climb back out of that. So now we have recovered those jobs, but we have had an increase in population and labor force. So that hasn't soaked up the rest of the labor. That's why our unemployment rate is still a little higher than it was before uh, the recession. So I just want to take one minute to recognize and talk about the different composition of the jobs that we currently have in LA County to what we had before the recession. I'm talking about this in front of all audiences, and I've done that before here as well. So, for example, right now, today, we have 90,000 fewer manufacturing jobs in L.A. County than we had in 2007. Those jobs paid an average wage of approximately $52,000. So, but luckily, we've added 90,000, same number, jobs, but they're in food services, and the average wage of those jobs is around 20000 in another example, we've, we have now, today, 35,000 fewer jobs in financial activities, accounting services, engineering, and architectural services. Their average annual wage was around 85,000. But we have 49,000 additional jobs in in-home supportive health care services, and that annual average wage is around 14,000. So, you know, I, I don't really like to wave my hands at the aggregate job growth and say everything's fine, we've recovered our jobs, we're back on track, because things are really changing. The world is changing, and we have to recognize that, and we have to prepare ourselves for that. And so you're hearing a lot about that today. 
that the speed of innovation technological change is just, is just so, it's lightning speed now. We can't keep up with it. it. We don't even know what the future looks like anymore. Uh, we're digitized, we're miniaturized, we're globalized, we're all connected. The speed of technology is increasing, the computing power of computers is increasing. Uh, so uh, this is something we have to celebrate and we have to capture and we have to capitalize on. This is my sixth year here presenting at the um, Economic Summit. And for the past five of them, I have talked about the need to focus our efforts, whatever work we do, on our comparative advantages and promoting the industries that we have strength in and that are export or traded industries so that we can continue to innovate, provide well-paying jobs for people, to improve our products, and to sell them to the market across the globe where there's six billion people and increase our market share rather than continuing to think about selling into the local market. And, and uh, this, is, this is our clarion call every year that uh, we have many legacy industries that are uh, innovative and that are uh, highly technical and technologically advanced, such as aerospace and entertainment, which is moving into an entirely different world. But we also see new industries that are emerging from these, so advanced transportation. We're the car market of the nation, so any advanced transportation uh, technology is going to be tried here. We're the source of it. We're, we, are, we are where this is going to spring out. Uh, digital media, similarly. This is our legacy industry that's morphing into something completely different and is going global. And we are the center of this. We have to be a place where companies that are technologically advanced and innovative want to be. Um, so that I, I think we see uh, many industries that are generating new ideas here. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, moving on, let's hear about the Inland Empire from John Husing. Good morning. The Inland Empire, I think, is an area that still is not well understood generally. Uh, throughout the country, the state, even in the Skag region. First of all, we have a population this year of four and a half million. That makes us the median-sized state if we could saw it off and create our own state. Half the U.S. states are smaller in population, half are larger. We lost 140,000 jobs, which was 10.8 percent of our jobs during the Great Recession. The good news is we have now recovered all of those and in fact sit almost exactly 100,000 jobs above where we were in 2007. The other piece of good news for the inland region at this point is the quality of those jobs is very similar to what was there before the recession. One of the things I track carefully is how the, the sectors that have grown or the, the jobs that have grown in the Inland Empire uh, and what they pay compared to the state. And it turns out that at the bottom end, which is the part a lot of us are worried about, 38% of our job growth from 2011 at the start of the turnaround through 2016, 38% of our jobs were paying 30,000 or below. In the state of California, that number was 48%. We don't have a high end. That is our issue. Our high issue, frankly, is 20 percent of our adult population has a bachelor's or higher. Uh, that is about half what you find in the coastal counties. So we have a very distinct competitive disadvantage for where a lot of the jobs are going, going forward. The reason that we have a smaller share of lower paying jobs out of that job growth since the turnaround, uh, frankly, is because of the blue-collar sectors. So that is an advantage in the short term, but it's a disadvantage in the long term uh, because of what is taking place with technology. Uh, just a quick uh, example, I was interviewing the owner of a very large distribution company that has their headquarters for the United States in the Inland Empire. 
they have a warehouse that is 1.8 million square feet, 50 feet high. No one works inside the building. They have 600 employees who are in, hired to take care of the technology, which is robotics, which is the environmental systems, the, the air, lighting and air and all the rest of that. They have to be much better educated than the kind of folks that we used to think of working in that particular field. The only part of that operation where the product is, t is touched is as it comes out of the truck. And he, the guy that was their world, their, their national or international vice president said, $15 an hour, if that happens here, we will very quickly eliminate that job too. And that really is our, our difficulty going forward, is dealing with the fact that our economy, because of the fact that 47% of our adult population is high school or less, is oriented to the kinds of jobs that people can do, but those are the kinds of jobs that we are erasing. Frankly, it would be our advantage if we could shut down Silicon Valley for five years. <laughs> our job growth numbers have been rather spectacular. When you look at 2015, the number one metro area in the state adding jobs was LA County. Number two was the Inland Empire. Number three was San Francisco metropolitan area, which is San Mateo and Marin and San Francisco. So we really added a ton of jobs, 58,000. Again, with the quality that does represent who our labor force is, our problem, the, the, the sitting in front of us is, all right, that's fine for now. Where are we going to go as technology begins to do things such as uh, with Amazon? By the way, Amazon isn't talking about eliminating their entire labor force. It's their labor force delivering that they're talking about eliminating with we have in, in our area right now 15, uh, or excuse me, 15,000 people working in warehousing and distribution for Amazon alone. If you're ordering anything online, you're ultimately getting it from the Inland Empire because that's where all those facilities are located because of the size. It takes 52 acres for a million square foot facility and really we're running out of that land now as well. But going forward as the technology changes, that particular sector, which has been responsible for 23% of our direct job growth since 2011, the pressure is going to be on it changing that. So at the Inland Empire Economic Partnership, where I serve as the chief economist, one of the things we're really looking at hard is, all right, what jobs are opening five years, 10 years, 15 years, where are we going to be? And then working with our education sector to say, all right, what training are you going to be delivering and how to meet the jobs that our local business community sees coming forward? But this is, I believe, trench warfare. This is not something that's going to be spectacular. It's going to be grinding it out. And I think of the regions, to, together with Imperial, of the regions in the Skag area, we face the toughest challenge being brought by technology. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Matthew, can you tell us what's going on in, the, in Ventura County? Uh, it'd be my pleasure. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Fina from California Lutheran University, and it's a privilege to be here representing uh, Ventura County. Um, so as you read the SCAG regional summary, um, you'll notice Ventura County is called out twice uh, as having made strong contributions to increases in average income and decreases in poverty rates uh, re uh, across the SCAG region. Uh, and while those are good numbers, I want to highlight a different story uh, and some different data points that I think are really worth considering as it relates to Ventura County. So chief among these is that seven years after the start of the recovery, uh, Ventura County still has fewer jobs than we did prior to the recession. And so this is more than a year after the Skag region recovered its jobs. Ventura County is still down. 
Uh, and so this leaves Ventura County uh, nearly alone in this regard. Labor force participation is declining significantly in the county, and population growth has slowed to just above one half percent. So together, these are actually contributing to a labor force that's shrinking in Ventura County. Uh, and for 13 consecutive years, uh, more people have left Ventura County each year to seek opportunity elsewhere than have moved to Ventura County. Uh, and so our very small growth rate is not even equal to the natural growth rate, which is obviously births minus deaths. And so declining labor force and negative net migration, these are phenomena that we usually associate with regions that are poor and hopeless or regions that are collapsing. I grew up, went to high school in Detroit, Michigan, so this is a scenario I'm all too familiar with. Uh, but this is, these are not dynamics we're accustomed to associating with a region that, that boasts of qu uh, high quality of life. And so our conclusion is that the pattern in Ventura County is not accidental. These are not merely structural changes happening to the economy. There are some of those related to uh, workforce composition. Uh, but the fact that Ventura County lags its neighboring counties and lags the state as a whole is not accidental. Uh, it's largely the result of policy and, frankly, the attitude about growth that those policies underscore. Uh, there's one example of this from the most recent um, elections. Uh, so on November 8th, uh, county residents got to vote on a series of land use measures. Uh, and many of you may know Ventura County has among the most stringent land use regulations in the country. So between 1995 and 1998, all of the uh, seven cities and the county passed a series of measures that impose urban growth restrictions around uh, the cities uh, and require a uh, majority vote of the electorate in order to approve any change to developed use of land in the county. Uh, and, and there is no automatic provision for future growth. And so the scorecard for these measures is pretty striking. So if we look outside the city of Santa Paula, those of you in the room from Ventura County know Santa Paula is a bit of an exception. Their, their attitude about growth is different than other cities, uh, in particular because of the contribution of one company, Limonera. But outside Santa Paula, since these measures were imposed in 1998, voters have rejected 12,244 acres of new development and have only approved 41 acres. Uh, and on November 8th, by a nearly 60% margin, we voted to extend those growth restrictions to 2050, uh, which is obviously a very lengthy uh, time horizon. And again, extended those with no additions of developable land. So not surprisingly, uh, despite negative net migration and declining labor force, Ventura County home values continue to rise. In fact, we've now recovered nearly 90% of the bubble price, the peak pre-recession price in housing. And again, that's despite slow um, population growth. Uh, and uh, as a result, now just 26% of county residents can afford the median home. Um, this is actually something that Hassan and one of the moderators, Steve Puntel, commented on this morning in the Ventura County Star. I encourage you to read that, how housing affordability and a, and a lack of interest in investing in infrastructure is a drag on the Ventura County economy. So when you consider all this, it's not surprising that Ventura County hasn't recovered its jobs. So the bad news is that Ventura County's situation is no accident. I also want to proclaim that the good news is that it's no accident, because it really means that this is not inevitable, um, that these are not structural changes that we have no control over. Uh, and I think there's really strong reason for hope. So to sort of leave you with, with uh, a message of hope here uh, at the end of the talk about Ventura County, I want to call out the, the community's agricultural community. So many of you know Ventura County, we have 300,000 acres, not quite um, uh, uh, what we heard earlier, 500,000, 300,000 acres of agricultural land, and 100,000 acres of that is prime agricultural land that's among the highest output and most valuable agricultural land in the United States of America. Uh, and that's despite Ventura County's agricultural community operating in an environment that they would tell you is hostile. So high land costs, high housing costs, high and rising labor costs, labor regulation, limited water supply, increasingly constraining environmental regulations, especially relating to the use of fumigants uh, on berry production, and then land use policies which require some farm operations to happen inside cities rather than on farms. Uh, and amidst all of this, farmers are leading a really unique effort to innovate and 
uh, address the area's water shortage. Uh, and so um, I've had the pleasure of working with a stakeholder group that involves farmers and cities, but these ideas started with the agricultural community, and they are at the threshold of implementing state-of-the-art telemetric monitoring of all groundwater facilities in the county to really get a handle on what the water situation is. This came from farmers, right? The, I, uh, farmers will tell you they'd rather you read their bank statement than their water meter. Uh, and this, this is the change that they're driving. Uh, and also they are working, there's been a seven month long process in the county where farmers have been negotiating with the cities, listening to the, each other's needs. There's been give and take and compromise. And that group after seven months approved, a, a unanimously approved a package of recommendations for the implementation of a water market. Uh, and this will be the first of its kind water market if it's, uh, if it's actually implemented uh, to come out of s recent state legislation relating to groundwater. So change can happen. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll call out farmers as the party of change in Ventura County, uh, 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 to quote uh, 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 Mr. Morehouse. Uh, and um, and uh, hope can come and change can come from the most surprising places. Uh, and nothing motivates like a crisis. So I think that's part of the, the message with water. Uh, and so uh, the outlook, uh, if it sounds dire, uh, there's at least reason for optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to be very, very brief about Orange County so we can get to the panel discussion as quickly as possible. So very, very quickly, Orange County continued to be sort of an economic engine. We grew 40,000 jobs across a variety of sectors, business and professional services, healthcare, uh, construction industry is doing really well in Orange County was the largest contributor to job growth. Economic activity is on the rise, um, you know, increasing car and truck sales, higher occupancy rates and uh, uh, rental rates for commercial and industrial. Visitors are flocking to Orange County from both domestic and international. And our incomes are rising. The big cloud on the horizon for us, and you heard it, us refer to it earlier, both for Orange County and throughout the region, other than Imperial, is housing prices and probably in the Land Empire. Housing prices and housing costs in general are killing Orange County's future because our millennials are already starting to leave and that is projected to accelerate over the next several decades to the point where we're having 13% less college uh, uh, students in Orange County and about 10% less K through 12 students because those millennials move and then they have their children elsewhere. So that is by far is the biggest issue for Orange County. Other parts of the Skag region, that's a, that's a very big issue and that's one that we are doing a lot of work on but the solutions are not so easy to that. So at this point, um, I'll just conclude very briefly. Are you, Steve? Okay. Uh, my friend Steve Pontel is coming up here to moderate the panel. I just want to say, I think now that, you know, we're, we're back kind of to where we were, it's an opportunity for a fresh restart and a rethink. Steve's one of the best in the business, I think, in terms of leading us through that discussion. But I think, um, as Michelle referred to, it's where do we go from here? And what does that future bring? And we'll talk about some alternative kind of pathways. Uh, but I do think innovation plays a huge role in having us successfully move to that future. So the last, my last job here at the podium is to tell you that all these materials are available on SCAG's website, I think right now, actually. Uh, and I'll turn it over to my friend Steve Pontel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wallace. Let's give the entire panel a round of applause. So how many of you are like really excited about the future right now? Are you feeling it? Woo! And, and here's the challenge that you have is it's up to you, it's up to you to paint a picture not only for your community and your region, but Southern California as a whole. And so if you don't have an image or a thought about the future of the region and what its economic possibilities are, how can anybody else have an image or a thought about the future of the region? And so one of our jobs, and this is what I would challenge us to do going forward, is this is a great handout looking back. We, we need to paint this going forward. So we should take this and create two, three alternative futures that we can believe in and begin to communicate. So just something to think about as a to-do for going forward. 
Um, the other thing I was supposed to do is, if you want to ask a question, because we may not have time for a lot of questions, um, you've got to sign in to Poll Everywhere on the inside cover of the agenda. Everybody look at this. Now, because one of Darren's first thing is he's starting to already outsource jobs, so instead of having a person walk around with a microphone, you're going to actually text your, your question directly into the system. So we need fewer and fewer hu humans. Pretty soon we'll have computers up here answering all the questions. That's right. As we go forward, <laughs> probably not during John Husing's career, but some of the rest of you might be in trouble. So if you can download the app, log in to SCAG 2016. If you have a question, send it in, and we'll be circulating the questions and find some way to get the economists to answer them um, if we don't have time for the questions. So you can log in and look at that. So, um, and for me, Roland, can you come back up here and reopen the question thing just in case? Is this mic live? Can you turn on number four? Yeah, here we go. So can you reboot it on the, on the tablet right here, Roland? Somebody hit the screen and turned off the question part. Um, for me, it's really hard to stand behind a lectern if I'm talking to these people. So I'm sorry to the camera people that said I'm going to violate all protocols and kind of get this thing started. I think we have like 12 minutes left, and so I want to be a little careful on what we can actually accomplish in trying to moderate this. But, but let me start with kind of an opening question. And the, and the governor alluded to it. You know, the, um, it seems as though people are feeling, even with the recovery of jobs, people are feeling a level of angst, primarily represented by, if you aggregate the Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump voters, I mean, that's a high degree of angst. And I think most people agree that what people are reacting to is they don't like what's happening and they really don't like where things are going. And so let me just open it up. Anybody want to jump in first and say, is that angst rational? I mean, do you think that people have a reason for their feeling and if so, the follow-on question is, okay, so what do we do about that? How do we respond to the angst that people are feeling? Jump in. And if you don't jump in, I'll just start calling on people to <laughs> go ahead. Wallace, your hand moved. I'm, I'm going to take a first stab. I do think that there, um, uh, if you look at real incomes of m most jobs that we've created since the recession, but even if you look back farther than that, Real incomes for most uh, workers have been fairly stagnant if you adjust for inflation for about, I believe, about three decades now. We, uh, this economy is creating a lot of great jobs in certain geographic areas and certain um, sectors and occupations, but the vast bulk, and Christine alluded to it, of jobs that we're creating are lower paying, and that's not just something that happened in the last year. That's been going on for quite a long time. You layer on top of that, I think, uncertainty about the technology trends, automation, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence that we've talked about, autonomous vehicles. And I think that that's what's probably driving uh, people's fear. And on some level, it's, it's for a large part of our population, it's our, it's, those are rational things to be concerned about. So it's not irrational. Michael, what do you think? Well, you know, a year ago, I know Debbie Franklin's in the room, and she'll remember me saying this. I said we're entering a time of economic class warfare because of income inequality. And if you didn't believe that then, look at the rise of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and tell me if you believe it now. Now, what do we do about it? Well, from California's side, we're great at innovating. We are great at inventing. But what's got to happen is we have to have business regulation policies that when those things are invented, that they stay here and are applied here so that we can keep the jobs here. So, so John, the, the part of the region, as you indicated, maybe the Inland Empire and Imperial could be most affected by the rate of transition from humans to automation. So what, what do you see is, what, what do you say to people that are feeling it, seeing it, it's probably not irrational, what do you say to them? In our particular case, it's more it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. And so I think rather than what you say to people, it's more what are we doing with the structure of leadership in the area to begin to prepare the area to be able to try and catch up with the, level, the, the speed of change. 
And a good deal of the, I think, intellectual effort in our leadership groups in the Inland Empire is being devoted specifically to the issue of, all right, what are the sectors doing? Where are they going? Why are they going there? There's been an enormous amount of outreach to business uh, to try and understand where they see their labor forces going, what kind of training they feel people need to have. Our problem, frankly, is on the education side because we're not set up to be able to relax, react with any speed to what we're hearing coming out of the business community. However, we have superintendents, our elected superintendents in both, uh, both counties that really have their eye on that trying to see if we can't change it. The biggest challenge I suspect that we're going to face there is a shift in how the community college system reacts. We don't have time to take two years to put something through the curriculum committee when business is saying we need X, Y, Z such to train people. We don't have time for them to figure out in two years how to get it done. And that I think is, those are sort of the challenges we have. It's not that we're not trying to figure out how to do it. The question is the structure of the, the systems really isn't set up to move fast enough yet but it's not that we don't have our eye on that ball. So, Christine, I, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've heard in the past is, uh, you know, it, when, and this is using it, and you can think about the continuum of everything in between. When LA catches a cold, Las Vegas gets pneumonia, well, the Inland Empire is right there in the path of that. And within LA County, there are obviously highly variable parts of the county that are responding in different ways. What do you say, or what do you see to be able to relieve people's angst about the future? Yeah, I think this is a real big challenge, and, and um, Michael mentioned inequality, and that is from having many high wealth or high income individuals and then having growth of low wage jobs. I, I think uh, what I want to take issue with is responding to change. I, I think we have to get off the track of responding to change. I think we have to drive the change. We have the resources, we have the industries, we have we have research universities, we have people, we have this beautiful geographic region. Um, and I, I want to point out Northern California, they don't have a high education level because they trained their workforce. Their workforce was imported. They developed companies and industries that attracted a workforce to the region. So if all we're going to be doing is growing low-wage jobs, then we're going to have a, a bunch of low-wage workers. I mean, that's not, not disparagingly, but that's what we're going to do. So our challenge is to drive the change by developing high-wage industries and so that we can all prosper and people will come. It's not only about educating our current workforce, although that's important. Um, it's about, as I say, moving the ball forward proactively. So. Matthew, you said something I think that's really important for this audience to internalize and think about, because I think this is the biggest challenge to what Christine just said, and that is that we, we are creating the environment we have intentionally. This didn't happen by accident. And so the question is, there seems to be uh, the, the, the bulk of the voting populace, as represented in Ventura County, but I would say throughout this entire region, that is afraid of making the changes necessary for the economy to prosper. What, what, would you, what message can be carried out to begin to address the fear of change that the winning side of the ballot measures have? Yeah, so first I want to just challenge one premise of the question, which is uh, when I say that it didn't happen by accident, um, I don't mean that we're trying that Ventura County is necessarily trying to drive jobs away and to shrink the labor force. Those are unintended consequences of very meaningful policies. And so what I would encourage the room to do is really scrutinize what are those unintended consequences and what are different ways we can go about achieving those same goals. When you have something like preservation of open space and agriculture as a core value of a county and the county electorate, the question becomes how do you achieve that at the lowest cost and without the 
the, the sort of distributional impacts that it's having on incomes and jobs in the county. And there are certainly other ways. Uh, there could be a market-based transfer of development rights, you know, that internalizes the cost-benefit and uh, cost-benefit uh, analysis of preservation, right? There's communities that do this very same thing better. Uh, in fact, Montgomery County, Alabama preserved 50,000 acres of open space and agricultural land through a uh, market-based transfer of development, right? So there's other ways to do this, and that's the next step. So how do we do this caring for, um, you know, the most vulnerable and the middle class in particular in our county? And I also just want to push back, too, on the angst thing. Um, one fear I have, actually, you know, obviously, you look at the vote shares in California. We were not the same as the rest of the United States uh, in large measure. Uh, and so I'm not necessarily convinced that the dynamics are the same. I also worry, the flip side of this angst conversation is I worry that that maybe we're a little complacent. You know, Ventura County incomes are up, poverty is down, and, it's, it's, and California's economic growth is outpacing the United States, right? Well, it's outpacing the slowest recovery since the Great Depression, and that shouldn't be good enough for us. Uh, and so I'd also encourage people in the room, don't settle uh, and actually, you know, the angst is useful. Uh, I actually worry about not enough angst. So don't let good angst go to waste. Would that be it? And so, though, let, so let me let me kind of for the, by the way, we, we kind of expedited some of the programs. So those of you that don't know, my name is Steve Pontel, and some of you that know me more recently will know I've spent the last five years focusing on housing, but really the length of my career has been focused on economic development. I mean that's that's the bulk of what I focused on. And it was eight years ago, the last time I moderated this conversation, when Larry McCullen stole the idea for SCAG to actually think about it. And it was John Husing and Wallace and Jack Kaiser and Joel Kotkin on the panel at that time. And the reason was the belief that, you know, we either hang together or we'll certainly hang separately. That this region is one region that needs to figure out how to work together. And historically, we don't do that, you know, very well. And, and so my next question is, un, you know, can the region do well when different parts of the regions are doing poorly, especially over the long haul? And what is it that each of you think other parts of the region need to realize and understand and partner? So, Ma uh, Ma uh, Michael, you started out saying the region goes down the tank if we don't solve the Salton Sea. Because if we lose the Coachella Valley, then why even bother staying in Southern California? I mean, where are we going to go for the General Assembly? And so the, 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 the challenge, though, is, you know, we need the agriculture in order for the region. And, and you know, how, how is it you think the rest of the region needs to think about Imperial and Eastern Coachella and be at the table and be concerned about these issues? Well, first, I'll throw the zinger out there that'll upset probably two-thirds of the room. There is life east of the 605, <laughs> a significant amount of life. So what it really comes down to is this. There are still land-intensive industries. I mean, blue-collar people need blue-collar jobs, and we do have a lot of land-intensive industries. If, if renewable energy is something we're going to continue to do as a nation, it's land-intensive. Solar panels take up a lot of room. Wind takes up a lot of room. Geothermal takes up a significant amount of space, not as much as solar or wind. So you got to have that. Farming. We can do as much rooftop farming as, as you want to do in some of the coastal communities, but it's not going to be enough. So, and the distribution centers, John talked about a million square feet uh, uh, needing, you know, 50 acres plus for the trucks and everything else. Well, let's realize you have these land intensive industries and that's going to have to happen. So what the region needs to understand is that it is actually all interrelated. You didn't grow the salad you're eating for lunch here in downtown LA. The lights, there might be a power plant somewhere in LA. I know there is one in, in Manhattan, for example. There, there is a power plant in, in downtown Manhattan. Um, and, but I don't know of one in here. But you have to just realize that, that we need each other. At the same time, when I need a good attorney to go litigate something or a good accountant to go fight with the IRS on my behalf, it's usually somebody on the 89th floor of one of these uh, buildings around here. So, and. And I do like to turn on the TV at night and, and watch Governor Davis on Jay Leno or whatever it was that he was on. So w we are interrelated. And, and the truth is, is, you know, everybody's trying to do the same thing in this room. Feed their family, take care of aging parents, hope their teenage kids don't get in trouble after school today. You know, it's the same basic challenges, no matter whether you're in Santa Monica or in El Centro. So Wallace, uh, page 12, uh, 
is a pretty stark Orange County page, especially with regard to, as you referenced, the loss of millennials leaving Orange County and the aging of Orange County. And so, but is it really, a, do you really think we should be talking about that as an Orange County issue, or should we be thinking about the nature of the relationship between Orange County and the Inland Empire and how housing is being met and the needs are being met, and think maybe more about some of the connective tissue between the regions, as opposed to maybe drawing those artificial geopolitical boundaries? Oh, great question. Thank you. I already had my answer, and I will morph <laughs> my answer to that question. But, um, of course, I don't believe in artificial boundaries. Business doesn't, no. they locate in a place not because it's in a particular city or county. But I, I just want to back up just for one minute and say, this future, there are going to be winners and losers. There's no question about that geographically. And I'm talking about Southern California as a whole here and other regions. And we can be the windshield or the bug here. And we have to be, I think, a little bit more aggressive in terms of regional economic development. The one thing when you look at this, in the entertainment business, the aerospace business, et cetera, the one thing that uh, links all of these things is we were the place in the world that the best and brightest came to, to for their entrepreneurial dreams. So we need to create region-wide an entrepreneurial environment, both for folks that are already here, so retaining those millennials, but also attracting folks from throughout the world. And that means different things for different places in the region. I'm not saying it's not a one size fits all approach. In Imperial County, it could be innovation in agriculture and water. In Orange County, it's medical devices. In Los Angeles County, it's entertainment, video production, music, uh, et cetera. So that's to me what the biggest thing is. We have to get a lot more entrepreneurial as a region and support that with some real resources and some infrastructure and make that the top priority. All this other stuff will take care of itself if we do that. But we've kind of lost our way there, and that's where Silicon Valley is kicking our butts, basically. So, Christine, what does L.A. need from the rest of the region? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, we are so super connected, right? So everybody knows we have these huge ports, and they're uh, importing 40% oh, of all container traffic is coming through our port. Uh, it doesn't stay in L.A. County, right? It goes straight into the Inland Empire and, it, and is managed. So we, we are all, we have a, a neighboring county, Orange County, that doesn't look any different than we do, although we see in the, in the data. But as Wallace said, businesses don't know where they're, they just land somewhere. They think, you know, I'm living down the street here and I, I want my company here. So we're all going to be connected. And, um, you know, I think the transportation network is, is something that we really have to focus on. We're looking at 38,000 square miles in this region. You know, when we talk about Northern California and Silicon Valley, we can fit the entire Silicon Valley into the space that LA City takes. So it is a very small, compact neighborhood. We're not talking about that. We have expanses of miles, and, and we have to communicate with each other, and, and that, that's going to require a lot of infrastructure. So the plans that we have underway now to improve the, the transportation of goods and people and communications is really uh, critical. You know, John, it was probably, oh, I don't know, 30-some years ago that I learned from you my mantra about being in economic development and thinking that, you know, having this huge impact. And what you said was the macroeconomic forces are going to shape the future of the region with us or without us. The most important we thing we can do is reduce the friction of information. So what information friction do you see that exists between the regions? Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer to that because I was thinking about something entirely differently and I'm going to answer my own question. <laughs> Anybody want to moderate this panel next year? <laughs> I want to pick up on something Matthew said about a large part of what we face as a region is because decisions have been made to shape the direction things are going. And when you look at the state of California, which really isn't a state in some respects, it has some very distinctive regions that are very different from one another. Our politics in this state are largely dominated by thinking coming out of the Bay Area, an area where over 40% of the population has a bachelor's or higher. 
it's, I believe that the consequence of that is that the poverty issue, which to me is the most important single thing that has not been discussed and has not been fixed up in the capital. And in terms of the region, we need to be able to establish for us what is the agenda we want done and make sure that our representatives in the state legislature start to look at what Southern California as a whole needs rather than just mimicking whatever the heck the, the former mayor of uh, Oakland thinks needs to be done and all of his allies who tend to come out of that particular part of the state. So I'm all in favor of state warfare uh, on the political level to come up with an agenda that will allow Southern California to evolve the way we would like it to rather than a context that we don't control right now politically. I'll just give you one example. Uh, and it really kind of goes to something that Christine said. I, two of my clients are the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of uh, Long Beach. Why as an Inland Empire economist? Because we are so. I can't understand the Inland Empire without understanding what's going on at the ports. They're that clear, most carefully linked. And then the issues that, that uh, flow from that. When I was working on the clean pro truck program down there, I was asked to meet with a, a group of truckers who wanted to propose uh, a financing mechanism that would allow LNG to compete with clean, di uh, clean diesel. We had the meeting. I asked them, fine, you want me to help you get 16,800 sales of a truck that you've sold to nobody as of yet. They said, absolutely. I said, would you build them in California? They said, under no circumstances. And right there, the, we have no policy that I'm aware of that says that the tools that we need to come up with in order to meet our regulatory requirements are made in this state. They're largely imported from someplace else. And the result of that is a huge amount of our policy uh, is job killing rather than with no uh, emphasis on job creation to go along with it. And I think there's a huge opportunity lost as a consequence of that. So now we're going to do speed, speed questions to the economists. So any one of you jump in and answer it. Um, anybody have an additional comment about the impact of the $15 an hour minimum wage on the region? It's going to kill one. jobs. The people that are left are going to do well, but it's, going to, it's too high. And it's exactly like the, the situation I cited. Companies are going to quickly try and figure out how to eliminate uh, those folks if they can figure out how to do it. So you'll have some people benefit, but a large part of, of will be the elimination of jobs. Yeah. And, and add to that the, the uh, overtime regulation. Uh, and there are industries that will be harmed. So I'm hearing from the agricultural community that this could be devastating. And so $15 an hour in El Centro is different than $15 an hour in Santa Monica. So it's a challenge in that way as well. Is it really possible to close the gap between the rich and the poor in Southern California? If you do it with a $15 an hour minimum wage, I mean, here's the problem. I just had this discussion with my 13-year-old daughter the other day. It's real simple. Should two people who work full time, whether it's at Walmart, cleaning a hotel room, uh, waiting tables, whatever it is, should they be able to reasonably, whatever reasonably is, but support their family? Unfortunately, we have an economy in California right now where that doesn't work. You have two people working 50, 60 hours a week at these minimum wage jobs, and they're barely struggling in a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. And I, I'm not sure if that's right. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, but I'm going to suggest if we're going to have a service-based economy, and almost every economist up here said that there's been huge rise in their subregion in, in the minimum wage type jobs, retail, food service, and the like, we darn well better figure out a way that these folks can uh, support their family. If not, take the Bernie Sanders stuff and multiply it by four for four years from now, because that's where we're headed. What manufacturing is, is realist? Should we be realistically focusing on that can grow in Southern California? No. Well, I mean, I, I think I, like everybody else, I'm in favor of manufacturing jobs because they're typically high, higher paid and, and they provide a pathway to the middle class. Uh, in, in history, that's been happening. But in a high cost state as we have here, um, manufacturing that's going to occur here is going to be highly automated, highly technical. It'll be monitored by a few highly skilled people that are monitoring the machines. 
We will continue to increase our manufacturing output and be very efficient and productive at it, and we're, we're probably among the best in the world. But manufacturing employment is changing entirely. So I think the focus, and it's becoming a much smaller share of our overall workforce, our focus, although, like I say, I'm not, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous job if you can get it, but uh, our focus should be on, on, on those areas that we do the best at and, and continue to generate high wage jobs. So what, um, there are a bunch of questions about what role government should play. Should we create a, uh, say, public sector venture capital fund to go after certain industries? Um, should SCAG play more of a role in trying to develop a cluster strategy? Any thoughts about that? Uh, you know, I, I do think SCAG is uniquely positioned in the region to develop a region-wide economic development strategy. We have one for Orange County that we've developed. Uh, Christine and LADC have developed one for LA County. I'm sure there are, um, in every county, there are economic development strategies. But getting back to that point about this, there's something about this region, the size, the scope of it, that we are more, um, we're better together than we are individually or apart. I think uh, we do need a region-wide for all six counties economic development strategy. And the core of that would be looking at clusters and looking at what our comp competitive advantage is. Community colleges, their role in the, in the scheme of things and what should be adjusted in their curriculum? I taught community college for 17 years. I was also a, an administrator. I ran the Division of Business and Economics at a community college. The community colleges for the creation of jobs that meet the technical needs of what business is looking for, we've given them that responsibility. The change that I think needs to be made is on the community college campuses, 50% of the power rests in the faculty senate, which tends to be dominated by those folks who think of the community college as the first two years of a four year ed education. And the guys that are interested in tech and business tend to not be interested in campus politics. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to the presidents of the campuses, they are frustrated in their inability to get things to move at the sort of speeds we need them to. And that system, therefore, I think, it really needs to be reformed. We've got some campuses that are great, but we have some that are unbelievably lousy because of the fact that they're dominated by folks who just don't get what the changes are occurring and what their mission needs to be. And this isn't specific to community college, but I wanted to highlight two neat, interesting things that are happening in Ventura County. Uh, one, Cal State Channel Islands is actually teaming up with local engineering firms uh, to create a program that develops the skills specific to those local industries with an emphasis on trying to retain graduates so that they stay in Ventura County. Ventura County, like the state, produces more college graduates than it does jobs for colleges. Uh, California Lutheran University is teaming up with banks to create a pipeline to identify high achieving candidates who want, have a strong regional preference and want to stay. And so I think there's opportunity here for the for-profit business community to be partnering with, with uh, community colleges, colleges, uh, and nonprofits in this regard. Just to follow up very briefly, that's what's changed revolution, revolutionarily in the labor market is it's skills-based. It's not about the piece of paper or the diploma you get. It's not about what institution necessarily you go to. And this is not just for community colleges. It's about the skills that employers are seeking. So when you hear about skills gap, where there's 5 million job openings and we still have all these people unemployed, it really is, that's where the labor market has moved. And everything is about skills and the skills that you have that are marketable in the labor market right now and valuable to employers. So there are a variety of other questions, and like I said, we'll create a forum where these questions could be answered. So you each have your 10-second admonition to this audience. What would you do if you were them to change the economy of their community and the region? 10 seconds. Wallace? Start on that end. John, go. <laughs> John's You're starting quicker with than, me? Yeah. Oh. John's quicker than me. Sorry, I'm in another place. Um, <laughs> what would I have these folks do? I would have these folks make darn sure that the representatives in the state senate and the assembly from this region understand what needs to get done to get allow this region 
to succeed rather than just stand in line with folks coming out of Northern California. Kathy. Can anyone in this room do anything about the Bowl Championship Series? Michigan's number five, <laughs> and there's only four. Uh, I, so I would say seek out opportunities to remove delay and uncertainty. Uh, CEQA reform is, is obviously, uh, to me, a top priority. So I'm going to put in a, a good call for innovation, invi inviting and, and embracing innovation, encouraging uh, entrepreneurship in your own communities. You can do that through developing uh, co-working spaces, maker spaces, uh, developing networks of support systems with other uh, entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists, whatever resources they need. I think you can do that within your own community today. You can start right now, and, and, and that will help us uh, move forward. Technology has changed the world. Get more and more of the residents in your community to learn how to sign the front of the paycheck, not the back of the paycheck. Then they're relying upon themselves, not anybody else, and not the worldwide economy in an aggregate. I would say, um, you know, the state, economic development is not a priority for the state, and I don't see it becoming another priority. They eliminated the agency basically over a decade ago. Uh, just like SCAG and uh, Hassan's leadership, we have taken control of our own destiny here. Still try to work at the state, um, but we, we can't pass all responsibility to them. We have to take responsibility ourselves. So whatever jurisdiction you're in, you, we have to play in the economic development game because other states, other cities, other regions are, we, we're non-existent in that region, uh, in that area. So we have to, and each city, each county, um, we have to take responsibility for economic development in our location. That's what Very good. And I'm just going to add one additional element. This is the most creative place on the, palette, on the planet across all industries. So it's bad on us if we don't figure this out. Give the panel a round of applause. And let's give Steve Pontel, what a great moderator. Let's give him a round of applause. We do have a small token of our appreciation, so please don't get off. And there he goes. He's on his own. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. He's on his own. I'll pass these out. Thank you.